Good evening, everyone, and thank you for attending AACP's webinar with June Williams and Steve on screening for craniofacial pain and sleep breathing disorders in dentistry. Attendees are encouraged to submit questions in the Q&A box. Questions will be addressed at the last 10 minutes of the presentation. Real quick, I want to introduce an upcoming event for AACP. August 12th through 13th, 2022, AACP will be hosting the 37th Annual Clinical Symposium in Spokane, Washington, On Common Ground, TMJ, Art versus Science. Go to aacfp.org for slash 2022 meeting to register. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker, June Williams from Steve. June graduated with honors with the Diploma in Dental Hygiene in 1991. Early in her career, she worked alongside many of the most renowned leaders in her field, becoming a sought after clinician, international lecturer and consultant and has dedicated her career to lifelong learning. She has been instrumental in developing systems for screening and treating patients with sleep breathing disorders, myofunctional disorders, orthodontic problems and craniofacial pain PMJ, acquiring over 5,000 hours of study and 3,000 hours at the podium educating other professionals. She's known as a leader in the prevention of disease and is an advocate of multidisciplinary approach to healthcare. Aside from her 30 years in clinical practice treating patients, June heads the clinical training for TMJ and Sleep Therapy Center International and is a director of education for Vector Diagnostics. And most recently, along with her husband, Brett Steed, began offering myofunctional therapy services specific to pre and post-surgical tongue lip ties releases. And now I will hand it over to June. Yes, I'm June and I had a quick look at the attendance list and I'm just thrilled that there's so many people that I know participating in this uh, presentation, as well as so many new, uh, new names and new faces. So I hope that I'm able to enlighten you with some tips and tricks to screening the patients uh, that we all see uh, all day long for pain and sleep breathing disorders. As, doc, uh, as uh, Jordan mentioned, I work quite closely with TMJ and Sleep Therapy Centers International. Uh, my mentor, of course, and is mentor to many of you is Dr. Stephen Almos. So a lot of the uh, presentation material that I'll show you tonight are things that I've learned from Dr. Almos, from his centers, from the other doctors who have the same passion for sharing information and, um, and treating our, our children early and our adults so that they can live through uh, healthy, happy lives. So my background as you can see from 1991, I've been around a long time, started uh, out as a hygienist, but I learned um, very quickly that that wasn't so my sole passion, that there was more things I could prevent other than periodontal disease. So um, looking at, at uh, malocclusion and looking at breathing problems. And of course, as time went on, I learned the relationship to uh, the jaw and the face and the breathing, the cranium, the nutrition, all of these things became so apparent, but I, I didn't learn it overnight. It's been a 30 year process. And most recently, even though I was aware of it back in the day, I, I didn't really understand completely the importance of how the nose and the breathing plays a big part in all of the things that I'm gonna to talk to you about today. So I've, I've got experience in uh, many different practice settings general practice, ortho, pain, sleep, myofunctional, combined practices, standalone practices. And of course, in all of the above, we had a strong multidisciplinary um, theory and, and thought process. So working with other professionals. Now, mind you, that has changed over the years. Certainly what I thought was multidisciplinary 30 years ago is very different than today. The team is different. We still have a very broad um, multidisciplinary professional team, but we're working so much closer now with medical doctors. We didn't really have that support of the medical profession back in the day in, you know, ear, nose and throat doctors, sleep physicians, physical therapists. I mean, the list goes on and on. Osteopaths, uh, you, you know, we really chiropractors, we work with all of them. And that's why uh, today we can really see the successful treatment when we can get in and identify the pathologies that are seen and understand that we don't have all the answers in our practices. Um, what I've been fortunate enough to learn is a system for triaging, diagnosing, treatment planning, so that the patients indeed get to the right place at the right time. So that's an important thing that I've learned in the, in the pain and sleep practices. We're not gonna talk a whole lot about that today. Today, we're gonna to talk mainly about screening um, and screening in the dental practice. Many of you are um, 
general practitioners or maybe your team members of the general practitioner. You might be a hygienist. You, you, may, uh, you may be a dental uh, assistant or a, an educator, a treatment coordinator. Regardless, we all have to start looking outside the box and understand what we're really looking for and perhaps how it plays an important role in overall health. So I'm going to relate a lot of things to the health of the patient and take it out of the dental element. So I'd like to thank, of course, Dr. Almost. Most of you know him. You know, he's been very influential in, in treating and educating patients and professionals like you, alongside his team of professional doctors across the globe, uh, who I've been fortunate enough to know each and every one of them. Um, and, I, and I work with, uh, with one here in Southern Ontario, Dr. Lisa DeJoya, who has been really helpful for me to, to keep abreast with seeing the patients and, and, and the newer techniques that come ab uh, abroad. So this is Lisa here. And I know there's Kathy. She's on the call. I saw her name. And Charles, oh, look at all three of you were in a row uh, by coincidence. So I thank you all. And thank you, Dr. Almost, for allowing me to be part of this elite group. Um, of doctors. So there's doctor where I work. Um, and I'm showing you this because of the material that I show you is information that I get from working in the practices. Um, I head up the, the clinical training for the TMJ and sleep therapy centers with Dr. Almost. So I've trained a lot of the team members here. Um, I've been in the offices. I go in and teach people how to screen, teach them how to collect data. And that's what I do at Dr. Lisa's office in uh, Southwestern Ontario. So today what I'd like to um, achieve is to hopefully leave you with um, a why and a when we screen for, for sleep breathing in both adults and children. It's not just exclusive to the adults and when you would refer. So perhaps you're in, in a practice that only treats adults but uh, in pain and sleep, but you have children in the practice that have these problems and you need to be able to still identify them, not ignore it and understand who you could send them to what to look for from a subjective and an objective perspective. So we'll review a little bit about that, gathering some information to know how to say what you're going to say to get the message across, because our goal is that we want the patients to accept the recommendation to uh, collect further data. You see, most of the time we're seeing these patients on a, on a dental hygiene appointment, a recare appointment, uh, a new patient exam. I'm referring to dental practice setting at this moment, although I'll reference other professionals momentarily, but you all know sometimes if you say too much, you'll blow it. So we have to be very clear on how much information you give the patients at these very introductory meetings about something that you might see pathological that might be affecting their teeth, of course, their gums, of course, but also their overall health and how it correlates. Um, that comes with confidence. So I, I want you to learn today. I want you to continue to learn after because it takes years for us to really have the confidence to feel comfortable, to not feel the patient might ask us a question that we don't have the answer to, or, uh, you know, you get rejected so many times you lose, you lose your confidence as well. Um, it takes time to instill the need. It takes time in our ed education. And it also takes time for the patients to sometimes comprehend it. So don't give up after asking them one time. You might have to revisit it each visit you see them, whether that's in six months, whether that's next week when they come back for a filling. Um, everybody on the team has to be aware of what the screening is, what you're looking for, and how it relates. That would be my goal today. So when should we screen for, the, for these problems, for pain, breathing, sleep in the dental practice? Well, and it is my opinion that it should be at every appointment. It should be always, we should be thinking, well, why is this happening? Why did the patient wake up with a broken tooth? Hmm, if they woke up with a broken tooth, you might be able to track back to understand the, that there might be bruxing or clenching or other things going on at night. So it's not just when we see a new patient, it's not simply the dental hygienist role, it's all the time. Just always be thinking, why did this might, you know, how did they present with the problems that they're presenting with? And that if there's something underlying a cause, then you may be able to offer the patient recommendations to get them evaluated more thoroughly. You see, you cannot do a thorough evaluation at any of the appointments that you see on the screen patient comes in for emergency, you don't have time to spend an hour 
working them up um, for TMJ and sleep breathing disorder. That has to be brought them um, to their attention that they need to schedule time for something more comprehensive. So um, problem number one I see in dental practices is that you try to talk too much right from the get-go. You give them way too much information, you overwhelm them, you're, you're trying to sell them something that you don't even have um, the complete picture of yet. So you don't wanna be talking about things that you don't have all the data. So that's, that's number one failure in my opinion on why people might not schedule an appointment to come back for a full, full assessment. So you really have to be thoughtful in what you're talking to the patients about. But you should be thoughtful at all appointments. You should be thinking this at all times. And I hope after today, me showing you a lot of the pathologies that you might see that you will indeed um, have a different perspective. Now, not just we dental people, you know, I don't know if we have any primary care physicians or nurse practitioners or nurses or other practitioners on the call this evening. I hope so, because you too can be looking at the things that I'm gonna show you. And, um, and I think that we need to be continually looking together to find the right answers to get the patients feeling better quickly and long lasting. So it's a multidisciplinary uh, opinion all the time. It can't just be single-minded. So it's multi multidisciplinary. And this is how we're gonna have the key to success. So success is just not what we do. Success is working as a team to get all the P's and Q's in order to give the patient what they would like, which would be maybe not have pain or maybe sleep through the night or uh, you know be able to chew. Uh, these are all things that we look at because they do want to have nice teeth, but they wanna be healthy people. So I've always been an advocate for put, let's put health first. The pearly whites can be the pearly whites afterward. And we sometimes have to take our dental hat off and put on our overall health hat in order to really instill the need. Screening patients is an ongoing assessment. So it's not simply that you tell them once uh, to floss their teeth and that you know they're gonna be 100% compliant flossing their teeth here on in. You have to revisit every time you see them when you're cleaning their teeth. So have you been flossing? You clearly can tell if they have interproximal pockets and they've got bleeding that they probably haven't been, but it doesn't stop us from instilling the need on the importance. So we revisit the same thing. We look at, as a hygienist, we're not just looking at periodontal pockets and bleeding gums. We are looking at the oral cavity, the oral complex, and the overall health of the patient. So we are already collecting data and finding pathology, but it's important to uh, add a couple of other tools. Like I know you probe pockets. Now you just don't probe the pockets that you think you have a problem with. You probe all of them. You take bite wings when doctor recommends you take bite wings on all of the patients. You don't just pick and choose who uh, would have benefits to cover the bite wings. I mean, there's a reason why you take these. You don't just do mandibular ranges of motion on someone you think might have a problem. You do it on everyone. And then you have a record to know if they had a problem pre-existing and what that problem might be, the severity of it. So that next time you see them, you could say, well, last time you only opened 30 millimeters, I could hardly clean your teeth. Now you're only opening 22 millimeters. I really can't get in there to clean your teeth. Like maybe we should do something about this. You also want to take blood pressure. We'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. And medical history. You do all of these things um, routinely, but we just have to have an a, 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 a note in our mind of why we're taking these measurements. It's not just to find the person who has deep pockets. We don't just take uh, blood pressure on someone we suspect has hypertension. You do it on everybody. And low blood pressure is also not good. So some people will say, oh, my blood pressure is just normally low. Well, you know, there's an, uh, an ideal range, but too high is no good and too low is no good. So we want to document for all of them. So you take your imaging. I know you take, um, some of you have CBCTs now. So you take all of these radiographs and we take them and we see things on them and we can use that information to complement what we see clinically, subjectively, as well as uh, objectively. You can see attrition, uh, you use the pocket uh, depths uh, as well. So dentists and hygienists uh, are seeing uh, patients more frequently than the nurses and the doctors because they come to us three, six months. Um, and many of them have these dental problems that are sleep breathing disorders. 
So I want you to start thinking outside the box. And of course, when we make some suggestions on the way we think, we have to add a couple of things to do that we might not be accustomed to doing. So I don't want you to feel stressed about it because we're not gonna make this any length longer than a couple of minutes to you what you're already doing in your appointment. So don't worry, you're not gonna be asked to do, you know, a whole slew of things, um, just a couple of things. And I think that after today's presentation, you're gonna want to, you're gonna wanna add these uh, tools to your already comprehensive evaluation of your patients. You know, maybe you'll just have some whys. So, you know, there's a little note in the, the office that I worked at that said, you know, be sure, you know, don't forget to update your histories, do fluoride when needed, the PANS, the OHI, the evals, and offer, you know, all these other services, but we still have to do the pain in the sleep breathing in both adults and children. That's key, because a lot of this stuff has to do with the, the pain in sleep. So in dental hygiene practice, this is a set out by the American Dental Hygiene Association, they, they were told that our role is de prevention of oral diseases. We're to support total health and promote overall health. And we have to do these crazy things like take blood pressure. When I was in school, we did it on every patient. Then when I came out of school, mind you, that was a long time ago, 30 years ago, it was, you know, we had business of production, mass production of doing hygiene in perio that we, you know, forgot to do all that great stuff they taught us in school. But I'm going to recommend that you do it again, because you could save a life. There's a lot of people who have hypertension that do not realize that they have it. And often there's a comorbidity between a sleep breathing disorder and hypertension. So, and you don't need to be a big person or overweight for this to happen and it's children as well. So we don't wanna assume. And the standards of practice for dental hygiene, and this was a 2016 scene that still says the ultimate goal is in providing, improving overall health. And in Canada, up here where I live, the CDHA, Canadian Dental Hygiene Association, optimal oral and overall health, like it goes on and on. We are trained, this is across the globe. I can pull up Australia, it's gonna be the same. Um, we are oral health counselors and health promotions. We're not just scalers and, and recall evaluators, okay? We have to look at the objective measures, uh, collect data that maybe we're not used to, that's not standard of care yet. I hope it is in the future, but we should be doing this for all of our patients in order to optimize their treatment plans and we'll have better outcome of their perio. You know, there's always patients who have periodontal disease from, you know, they have these unexplained pockets, they floss, they floss, they, but these pocket depths are there, the bone loss just keeps happening. And, you know, no one's looking at the etiology of the problem. That could be a sleep breathing disorder. It could be clenching, heavy overload. That's where the abfractions come in. So there's one article that is uh, obstructive sleep apnea in the role of the dental hygienist. And, and, you know, it's pretty clear here that um, that we are in a pivotal position to discuss the risks, the characteristics, medical referrals, and treatment options for OSA. So we're already there. They're recommending that we, as you know, uh, healthcare providers, uh, do this. Now, all of you on this call, if you're not dentists, you're probably hygienists of, of dentists. So I know that your doctors, who are members of AACP, are doing this to a certain degree. You might just find that you're not getting the, the patients to come back. That could be a real common problem I hear. And they're just not you know, committing to coming back. And that's because the need wasn't instilled. So remember today, I'm about to hopefully get you the be, to be the best need instillers and doctors on the call to be the best supporter of the need instillers. Because you don't want to have the hygienist spend all this time and I know this happens because I hear about it all the time. The hygienist spent all this time talking about all these great things. And then you come in and go, oh, well, we'll just watch it or we'll, we'll evaluate it next week when they're trying to build your business and they know you can help these patients because you're trained in pain and sleep. This is why you're a member of the AECP. So you can help all patients. So let's Let's support the hygienists who go through the, the spiel and the speech, regardless of the outcome. Because if they find, identify, now hygienists, you're not to make a diagnosis. That's not our job. Our job is to, to 
subjectively evaluate them, find a couple of objectives, make an assessment and a plan. Well, the plan, the SOAP format plan for this is to bring the patient back for more comprehensive data collection with the doctor. That's the plan. The plan isn't for us to try to give them as much information as possible at the end of their recall appointment. That's bad plan. The plan is not for doctor to come in and tell them that they have nasal obstruction and that that's causing them to have disturbed sleep without all the data. We don't wanna do that. We really do wanna follow a proper logical way. And the plan at this point is give them as little information as they need to commit to coming back so that they can have a full evaluation. The subjective information that's collected, of course, is the health history, the dental history, and, it's, and often they have chief concerns. So, you know, you ask the patient, are you having any trouble with your teeth today? Are you having any complaints? Uh, do you have any jaw problems? Do you have any bleeding gums? Or quite often they'll tell you what their chief concern is of the day. But they quite often, honestly, I, it's not, very rare do I come across a patient that doesn't present with a lot of these um, co-related pathologies. So again, you look at your imaging, you're going to use your intraoral camera and you're going to do a little uh, assessment, but you're going to do that after you look at the comorbidities. Because what we now know is that you can't separate the pain patient from the breathing patient. So if you just do TMJ, but you don't do breathing, I think you're only looking at half the patient. And if you only do sleep and you don't do pain, you know, again, you're not able to really get the patients um, to complete health because quite often they, they correlate. Sometimes they don't, but most often they do. That's in my experience uh, and, and uh, in all the years that we've been treating these types of patients. So we wanna, we wanna screen everybody and there is no exception. Um, I don't wanna be the patient that someone chose not to take the extra minute or so to ask me a question that could make me healthier or in some cases save my life. So we do it regardless of who we are. Well, why? Why do we want to do that? Well, the numbers are staggering. When it comes to headaches, if we look at the headaches here, 15% of all addicts complain of severe headaches. So that's one reason we can help people with headaches. And the headaches and the breathing are often related. So this is why we want to um, help people. If you don't, um, if you wake up with a headache every day, you're not going to be as productive during your, your, your work day. You might miss a lot of work. It costs billions of dollars a year to have people stay home from work because of headache pain. And the percentages, if you look here at the relationship, the techniques for sleep are the, whoops, sorry, didn't mean to go that so far, the relief of headaches, um, sleep is one of them. So they, you know, this proves that sleep can really help headaches. If you're deprived of sleep, you will have more headache. So it's, they go hand in hand. It's up to the doctors on the call and the doctors of uh, those that we work with as hygienists to determine the relationship and at what degree and what the plan will be. So 33 to 40% of kids uh, get at least one headache per week. This is children. The numbers are staggering for sleep as well. So if 90 million Americans snore, which is the precursor to OSA, obstructive sleep apnea, 40 million have a sleep disorder and sleep disorders represent a significant health issue. Sleep disorders aren't necessarily OSA. There are other sleep disorders, which we won't be able to get into this, the nitty gritties of all that today, but I can direct you to classes where you can learn more. 90 million Americans have OSA. So they actually means they have a diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea. And 80% of people have never had a diagnosis. So there's a lot of people who are walking around with a breathing problem a severe breathing problem. You see, it's not always a daytime breathing problem. We do have people who have breathing difficulties during the day, but when we're talking about apnea, sleep apnea, it happens at night. Obstructive sleep apnea is when the airway is blocked. It's because it causes an obstruction. And that's where dentistry can play an important role in helping patients with the obstructive apneas. So keeping the tongue forward, keeping the airway taut, these are ways that they can do it. And it's not always with an oral appliance. It's not always a dental appliance. It often is, or it can be in combination. So, you know, we don't wanna uh, dis discredit 
either of those techniques because we need both of them. The prevalence rate in children, 1.2 to 5.7%. This is referring to apnea. And the um, American Academy of Pediatrics is recommending that children should be screened for snoring. So on our screening form, it's a simple question. Does your child snore? And if the parent reports yes, then they should have a, a sleep study. They should have a polysomnograph should be performed in, uh, with snoring and symptoms and signs of OSA. So if the children have this, they're saying, you know, why aren't we checking them for this disorder? So if 8% if, uh, of children snore and 1% to 4% have OSA, so that's pretty significant. Now, I don't know how big your practices are, but if we were to just do the same math on a, a big practice that might have 500 children in the general dental practice, if 40 of them report snoring, 20 of them would have OSA. So 500 children, you, you're, you got 20 walking around with obstructive sleep apnea that might be going un, uh, unidentified and untreated. So we just want to be able to identify and refer to the appropriate place in the event that your doctor doesn't treat children, then we'll find places you need to find someone who will. We don't want to ignore. We don't say, oh, we don't treat kids here. You know, you, you have to identify it and refer them. So uh, this is interesting because the dental problems that might be medical condition, like a sleep breathing condition, include bruxism, uh, mandibular tori. I'm going to show you photos of all of this. Tori, palatal tori, mandibular tori. Uh, scalloping of the tongue, tooth sensitivity, perio disease, bone loss, broken teeth, recession and abfractions, large restorations, root canals, crooked teeth, and skeletal discrepancies. So isn't this pretty much every patient that we see all day long in dentistry? Now, if in medicine, if we can get the medical profession to understand that a lot of the medical comorbidities are <laughs> a dental condition that can be treated. So the comorbidities that they see, hypertension, type two diabetes, obesity, GERD, thyroid and cardiovascular disease, asthma, a history of respiratory infections, even um, ADHD in adults and children, tonsil and adenoid hypertrophy, chronic respiratory infections and speech difficulties are all things that they see all day long and we can help them. So this is the multidisciplinary world we need to start working together about. Just quickly, I made this graph 20 years ago when I was doing dental hygiene, I was working in an orthodontic practice that was a group dental practice that had ortho, general practitioner doing ortho. Uh, many of you know him, Dr. Rondo. So I worked with him for many years. And then when I was doing hygiene, the, the patient's parents would come in and say, you know, I've got these crowding. Is there anything you can do? And, you know, short of saying, yeah, you should get braces. I didn't want them to think that it was all about braces because I knew that if they just went somewhere to get braces, they might not get comprehensive evaluation of underlying conditions about why the teeth are crooked. So I use this little chart to help educate them, you know, how mouth breathing can create narrow arches and narrow arches cause the dental crowding and the, you know, everything's related. Forward head posture can be the result of a blocked airway, can cause the neck problems. But at the end of the day, the top of the graph and the bottom of the graph, allergy, infection, or injury, so I was referring to the nose here way back then, and it really is something that is not needed to be evaluated at the dental hygiene appointment. But I want you to understand that your doctors are looking at this. It's why they're getting successes in their treatment. So you don't need to talk about the nose to your patients, but you can make observation about the nose and you can make observation about their health history as far as sinusitis goes, um, allergies, are they taking um, allergy medications? Do they have skeletal discrepancies that you can obviously see, et cetera? Have they had a history of nasal surgery? Because if they had a history of nasal surgery, they probably had a nose problem to begin with. And we know that there's a relationship. So it is my opinion that good treatment starts with proper nasal breathing. So whether that's patients in our dental setting, patients in the chiropractic setting, patients in sleep breathing world. We, the nose is meant for breathing. So this is a very important part of getting successful treatment and stable treatment. Got to breathe from the nose. So
So this is what teeth and gums look like for someone who has a breathing problem. So we have recession, we have abfraction. This is where, you know, this is not toothbrush abrasion. This is abfraction. And this is where you can see the divots right in the CEJ area and lower of the dentition. The teeth are flared. They're almost horizontal in their angulation. We have missing teeth. Abfractions, look at this. So you could put the restoration there, but it, chances are it's just gonna fall off because the cause of the problem is likely still there. Clenching, clenching, clenching. Clenching for what reason? That's yet to be determined. We cannot look at this and say you're clenching because we don't have all the data. All we can say is you're probably clenching. Let's get you back and find out why. Why are you clenching? Because by doing dental hygiene appointment, we can't tell that. We don't know why. We can make some assumptions, but we don't want to mislead patients. And the patient could say, well, these areas are really sensitive. Yes, and we could restore them, but they're probably going to fall off. So why do you want to do that? Why don't we go find out why this is happening? Because this did not happen overnight. This has been going on for a very long time. Now let's look at some of the other things. Hmm. You, you report that you have disturbed sleep. You can't get to sleep and you wake up all night. Yes, yes. I said, well, you know, let's, let's look at that a little bit further. Maybe that's where you need to investigate is that maybe this is happening at night. I mean, I don't know by looking, but it might be worth investigating. The same thing with the occlusal wear and the heavily restored teeth. Look at the occlusal wear in this situation. You got to say, hmm, why is that happening? You can see the dentin. And these patients might be complaining of sensitive teeth or waking up with broken teeth. I don't know why that's happening, but it'd be sure worth investigating. Here's a young boy, same thing. He came with a chief complaint of breathing. His, his nose doesn't work. Well, look at, he, he has crooked teeth. And if all we talk about is the crooked teeth, he is going to forget the reason why he came. He came because he, he, he can't breathe and he's an athlete. But if we start talking about teeth, he's going to say, forget it. I don't want, I, I just want my breathing fixed. And you might, if you fix the breathing, incidentally, you might end up with the bonus side effect of straight teeth. So we have to ask the patients what their concerns are and direct them appropriately. Screening begins with taking a different approach. We are going to assume that everybody walks in with the problems I'm about to show you, and it's your job to rule them out. So we're going to take a dental problem, turn it into a medical problem. Let's look at the health history because there's all these comorbidities and they're both adults and children, hypertensive, diabetes, obesity, GERD, thyroid, cardiovascular, asthma, e respiratory infections and ADHD are just some of the comorbidities that we can see on a lot of health histories of both adults and children. The, the, adult, the signs and the symptoms are different, but they're all related. So we'll go through some of these in both adults and children. And you know, with the children, you know, you may see a lot of narrow arches, but an allergic shiners under their eyes, but they also will present with a lot of the same things that the adults present with. So let's look at the health history. Let's look at a couple of health histories. I know you all have your own version of a health history and they all primarily, these are dental intake forms for dentistry and they all primarily have the same questions, you know, like, do you have any of the following? Okay, do you grind or clench your teeth? Okay, so if someone says yes to that, well, to me, that's like perfect. Now I can relate their complaint or their, their findings of their own um, opinion of what they have with what else is going on in their health. So I'll show you a couple of examples. Um, so these are all the health concerns that are many of the health concerns that might show up. Well, here's another different uh, health history, um, you know, halitosis, uh, loose or broken teeth, sensitive teeth is a big one. And the, the health uh, questions are quite often checked off as, you know, I do have breathing disorders, I have asthma, I have diabetes, and you may find that they're being treated for these, but it's our job to relate the medical problems to the dental complaints. Same thing with the list of medications and their allergies. Okay, so it's not uncommon for patients to, GERD is a big deal, sleep, breathing problems at night, awakenings, muscle aches, sinus, the list goes on and on asthma depression is a big deal when you can't sleep and you have disturbed sleep you wake unrefreshed unrested it's really important 
that people get good sleep. I always explain it as there's three phases of being. You're either awake, which we all are now, some of us awake and choking. You are in non-REM sleep, which is stage one, two, three, or you're in REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. And we need to be in all three of those every 24 hours in order to be maintain good health. If you, if you went through life never being awake, you'd probably not be very healthy or you might even die. If you went through life um, never getting restorative sleep, it's likely not very good for your health. The same thing with too much REM or not enough REM. So it's important that our sleep cycles be a 24 hour and you need to follow three stages because we're always evaluating people when they come to the dental office, they're awake. But what we see in their mouth is happening when they're asleep at night. So we really do need to marry the concept. And I know you've seen these over and over again. I can go on and on. This is why the questions are on our health histories and the comorbidities to obstructive sleep apnea. I can show you study after study, diabetes, hypertension, asthma, obesity, although you don't need to be obese, hypertension, congestive heart failure, type two diabetes, right? It goes on and on and on. Obesity, hypertension, depression, GERD, high cholesterol even, high cholesterol is also one. So if you see someone on cholesterol medication, you got to look at other things. I've, I've not yet, I've yet to see one patient ever come in that just had maybe, oh, I have high cholesterol and perfectly healthy, have nothing else wrong with me. And they have no wear on their teeth and they have no um, <clears throat> breathing disorders and no pains, aches and pains anywhere with just something like that. There's often more, I, I don't know, I've never done the math on it, but it's almost everybody. And those of you who see these patients would probably agree with me. So let's talk about my mom. So here's my mom and mom is chief concern is she can't sleep. Many of you have seen this case uh, and I, I still show it because it really, I think it hits home with many of you on why we need to do this. So my mom went to the dentist faithfully every six months as we all did as children. We had a great dentist and the, the, you know, we had good dental benefits in those days. So she had good dental care. As far as we could see, we all did. The whole family had good dental care. She did have treatment for, you know, some TMJ issues about 25 years ago. But uh, this is, she's being evaluated 10 years ago. And um, her chief concern at this time is that she can't sleep. It used to be the pain, but now she doesn't talk about the pain, although she still has the pain. But her chief concern is she just can't sleep. She's awake all the time. So here's some comorbidities that we look at. High blood pressure, osteoarthritis, her thyroid's been removed. She also has GERD. And some of these things, honestly, I didn't even know she had. Her gallbladder was removed. She had a hysterectomy. So, I mean, what more parts do we want to take away that, you know, she said like all these things taken away. And she had sleep issues back then. Nobody looked at that, that nobody evaluated her for those. So, and my mother's tiny, she's tiny like me. She's tinier than me, actually. But these are her teeth and you know she had some nice veneers done of course she, she has a good dentist very nice dentist good friend of mine and she had ortho but she's missing some teeth so the uh, upper first quadrant and the lower quadrant lower uh left quadrant she's missing posterior teeth and she has partial dentures but she cannot tolerate them so so the, these partial dentures that she's had made years ago are you know in the medicine cabinet in the bathroom so she doesn't use them. So long story short, I convince her after a long time <clears throat> that she needs to be evaluated by our team of TMJ and Sleep Therapy Center. She saw Dr. Richard Goodfellow, dear friend of mine in Toronto, and Dr. Goodfellow <clears throat> had her set up for a sleep study. Now here in Ontario, you have to go through the primary care physician to get the sleep study um, and the sleep study, the physician didn't think there was any reason for her to get one. There was no comorbidities, um, but she was insistent because I was insistent and Dr. Uh, Goodfellow was insistent. And the result of her sleep study is that she has severe sleep apnea. So 30 and greater is severe. So it's almost severe. She has sig a significant oxygen desaturation lasting 30 minutes. So that's pretty scary. This dentition equals severe apnea. So this is the whole point here. So you look at the teeth, you might be there to clean them, but you got to look beyond that and go, hmm, they're nice clean teeth. However, why is she missing teeth? Why are they all worn down? Why does she have that fraction? Why can't she wear her partial dentures? 
Same thing looking at her extraorally before she even sits in the chair. Okay, there she is, tiny. She's, you know, she's not overly crooked. She doesn't look like she would be suffering from a lot of pain. She does have osteoarthritis though, which is a systemic inflammatory condition. So you can see the arthritis in the hands at her age. Here's her symptoms. So her chief concerns are she's fatigued, difficulty um, feeling unrefreshed in the morning, difficulty falling asleep, tossing and turning and awakening. So like every possible sleep problem she has, but she still has all these aches and pains too. And she has her legs in the morning are painful. She has very itchy arms, frequent urination and night sweats. So the medications that she were taking, uh, not just one for elevated blood pressure, but two, thyroid. <clears throat> I didn't even know she was taking this for pain and heartburn. Previous treatment she's had. And, uh, you know, she's still not better. So she's been doing this for a long time. So she gets referred for a CBCT. And the CBCT reveals that she has displaced condyle on this side and no condyle on this side. So we wonder why we take imaging. And, and this is important because that she wasn't born with that condyle missing. That's um, pathology of years of inflammation and dysfunction and obviously missing the teeth you know didn't help contributed to it but um, a lot of force on her teeth at night a lot of force on her teeth with her tongue and a lot of inflammation in her jaw so we can't just treat her for her sleep because she actually has a jaw problem too so she's going to get treated for both of course her nose has a deviation and a lot of inflammation in it which which is yet to be evaluated by an ear, nose, and throat as we have limits up here in this province. So she was treated by Dr. Goodfellow and her AHI went down from severe to mild, okay, just under mild, the high end of mild. And that's with an oral appliance because she couldn't tolerate the CPAP. See, the, the CPAP nasal delivery couldn't get in there. She just couldn't wear it, so she went without it. It'd be great if she would still have that. Um, or even seek consultation to have her nose um, looked at by uh, someone who will treat her non-invasively. And then I think she'll even feel that much better. So we were treated her for 10 to 12 weeks to help her with her pain. She has an oral appliance for her apnea. She'll have that for her life. And she's CPAP intolerant for now. And we'll see how it goes after, you know, we get we get her nose looked at. So that's where we at with mom. And there are, she gets to spend more time learning and living with her grandchildren because that's what life's all about, isn't it? So you can't separate the pain from the sleep. I'll just show you that here's another one. The little girl's complaint is uh, jaw joint locking. Okay, so she doesn't have any sleep complaints yet. Maybe we weren't really good at asking the questions, but she only told us of jaw locking, limited ability, ear pain and jaw joint noises. But when you look in her mouth, look at the scalloping of the tongue. So she's really, yes, got jaw problems, but she also has a breathing problem. And we, this study, which um, I can make sure you all get copies of, showed that tongue scalloping to be 70% predictive of, a, of OSA. So when you see that, there's often a relationship. So we can use a couple screening forms if you if you choose, this one was developed by TM Jane Sleep Therapy Centers. Um, if you've taken Dr. Almos's courses, you will uh, be provided with these forms um, as part of the course. Um, and I know many of you have. So it's just simple, five simple questions um, that we ask subjectively, and then a couple of things that we do to make some objective measurements. Okay, have you been told that you wear C that you need to wear a CPAP for sleep? If the patient says yes, okay. We know a couple things about that, don't we? We know that they've had a sleep study because nobody gets a CPAP, continuous positive air pressure without a um, sleep study. And then if we say, uh, have you been wearing it? And they'll say, no, it's in the closet because I can't tolerate it like my mom. Many people like that. 50% of the patients will have that sitting in the closet within a year. So, you know, what good is that? They still can't breathe. So you can offer them investigation further to see if there's an option for them. OK, what you don't want to do here is say, look it, you know what? You don't wear the CPAP. We can make you an oral appliance. You don't want to do that because doctor hasn't gotten all the data yet. You should say, you know what? We treat a lot of people 
And some of them need the CPAP, some of them don't need the CPAP. So maybe you should come and learn what could be possible for you. It'd be so worth it because you're not breathing at night or they wouldn't have done the sleep study. We don't know the severity of your apnea, but you know it would be, since you have the machine, somebody made that diagnosis. Do you use over-the-counter medication for headache pain so or a sleeping aid? So do you take melatonin to help you sleep? Do you take Advil or Tylenol for your headache pain? Can they, the three main questions you want to ask everyone, can you get to sleep? Do you stay asleep and do you wake rested? Um, and also, do you experience sounds in your jaw? Some patients might say, they have no to all of these and they say, yeah, I hear noises, but it doesn't bother me. They have no headaches. They have no problems. Well, you, doctors likely don't want to treat patients who just have noises and they can live happily ever after. So you do have to be, um, you have to relate everything to that you that you're looking at in the health history and in the clinical findings. We recommend a joint vibration analysis if you have the equipment. It might be something uh, that helps the clinical office staff give you a little bit more meat to plant the seed to make them making the buying decisions. And I'll talk about that equipment momentarily. Um, you take their blood pressure, you measure open bite, measure overbite and overjet. And you do ranges of motion. So how wide can they open? And they slide side to side. And these things, you know, they don't take long. You just use these little rulers that you can get. And it makes it real simple. It's not going to take a lot of extra time to do the, ask the patients a couple of questions and make a couple of measurements. Uh, the JVA, you would do that if there was an indication with sounds. Otherwise, the JVA is done at the comprehensive evaluation. And in the pediatric screening, the questions are a little different, but the parent asked, uh, you know, has to report they have any of the above. And then, you know, we do the same thing. Do they have open bite? What's their overbite over jet? Do they have crowding, uh, narrow arches, uh, et cetera? So you use these little rulers, you put the little notch on the lower incisor and you have the patient open. If they're in the red zone, it's not good. If it's out of the red zone, it's usually within normal limits, unless it's off the scale. That's not good either, because then they have hypermobility. They can open their ligaments or way stretched out. So the joint vibration analysis is equipment you get from bioresearch, and it's just a little sensor that goes over the jaw joints. The patient opens and closes, and it picks up vibrations, uh, different frequencies of vibrations, because you, you, you want to know, are you dealing with um, inflammation? Because that'll vibrate at a different frequency than disc displacement will and also bone or bone rubbing on bone will also have different frequencies. So I, it's, it's really great in, information that'll help the docs determine and complement what they're finding in other things. So you get that from Nate at BioResearch. I know most of you probably seen him. Another screening tool that can be used, again, less is more at the beginning here. So you don't really want to be doing this on a screening. You don't want to send someone home from a hygiene appointment with a sleep study equipment, okay? First of all, it wasn't planned properly. You're not planning to give them the equipment. You know, it takes some time to explain this to them. So this is not something you do at screening, but I just want you to know that it is a screening tool that can be used later. And um, that you get from Penny at Braybon. And we'll talk about those later. You can also ask uh, the patients to fill in an object, a subjective uh, sleepy evaluation. This is the Epworth scale we use for the adults, and we use a bare screening form for the children. So this helps you decide if you need to send them for a sleep study or if you will have them go home with a home sleep test like the Braybon Metabite. Again, this isn't something that you do at your hygiene appointment. Just keep it simple. This is stuff that's done later when you investigate further. Chair side screening at a glance. So these are things that you, in your mind, just go through. You can print this out, have this list beside you. I would suggest laminating it and you know, and, and you can just check things off on with a whiteboard and then you can erase it between patients. But it gives you something that you've looked at. And when doc comes in to check, you can say, you know, look at all these things The doc doesn't even need to talk to you about it. He can see all the things or she can see all the things that you've checked off. Wow. We've got a lot of sit things that correlate to a possible breathing problem, a possible jaw joint problem. And um, we would want to get them in for further valuation. Here's another one you can laminate and do the same. So, that, you know, the, is the tongue coated, enlarged, um, the tissues, the airway, the extra oral, uh, the nose and the posture of the head. So these are things that you can be looking at on all of your patients. You don't have to talk, give us a lecture to your patients on all these things you check off. These are just 
note to self so that you can figure a way in your mind while you're cleaning your teeth, how you're gonna plant the seed. Because we wanna instill the need, uh, normal versus pathology. You want them to go, wow, I really, I could benefit from coming back because yes, this is a concern of mine. Or preventatively, I don't wanna be like my mother who has chronic pain um, and takes this many meds. So you start evaluating them before you tip them back in the chair. This gentleman clearly has forward head posture. He has, uh, you can see the SCM muscle, you can see the subluxation here. And you know, these are patients that I would go, wow, if he's got forward head posture, why is he at forward head posture? Because for every inch your head is a forward of your shoulder, you add 10 pounds of weight to your cervical spine. So it's really important that we look at these things. We can look at the patient's um, image and see that you know they have heavily restored teeth or root canals. That might be an indication of heavy clenching and grinding. Uh, on this CBCT, there's a uh, deviation of the septum. It's quite severe and quite a bit of inflammation. Look at the tonsillar tissue. Look at the height of the tongue above occlusal plane and the, the uh, scalloping and the spacing. This patient's tongue is pushing the whole lower dentition forward, causing enough space to put in a whole other tooth here. Um, so this is a breathing problem. When you see these, you go breathing problem. And when you see this in a child or an adult tonsils that are this large, you say breathing problem, coated tongue. We grade the tonsils, zero, um, you can't see them. And four, they're like this photo. These are fours, they're practically touching. And this is a health concern because how can they swallow food without it getting stuck in the tissues? So this could be, you know, life-threatening. So you just have to get in the habit of getting back there and looking and evaluating at throats and tongues. And this patient had an uvula, uvula uh, uh, plasty. So they took the uvula away, but the patient still has a breathing problem and the patient still has disturbed sleep. And so that wasn't a good solution you know, might've contributed a little bit, but it didn't um, completely resolve the patient's problems. And kids have heights above occlusal plane. Look at the size of this tongue and look at the coating. These are all children and adults who mouth breathe. Um, the spacing, although is good, because we got broad arches, cross bites are not good. And tongue thrusts are not good. So when we have um, poor tongue posture, we have the underdeveloped arches. So, you know, the roof of the mouth, is the floor of the nose, so there's a breathing problem. And if the uh, tongue doesn't get up there with each swallow and doesn't sit there at rest while you're just hanging out there, where's your tongue? If it's down and it's not up, you're gonna end up with underdeveloped arches, both upper and lower. So when we can reestablish proper tongue position and expansion and development of both arches and airway, then we can actually see stability and because breathing and sleep, breathing and sleep are so related to pain with these kids, you might change their life because they're going to go through life maybe pain free. Open bites, you can still see mammalons still present after age eight. We know that they've not functioned on these teeth, and quite honestly, it's difficult for them to brush. So you you, you know you're giving them instructions on oral hygiene because that's our job as hygienists, but. Why is that? Well, they can't get up there unless they like lift their lip out of the way and get their toothbrush up because the teeth will not erupt because the tongue's living in there. So you could send them out for ortho and they can have one of these cribs that keeps the tongue back or in the next case, I'm gonna show you the thumb keeps the thumb out, but it's not gonna be the result because if this tongue is pushing forward, it's usually pushing forward for a reason, like the patient can't breathe. So why would we put in something to prevent them from breathing completely? Um, my experience with these appliances, and I know there's a couple of orthodontists on the call. Uh, I saw the list and, you know, you would agree with me that if they're breaking this 040 stainless steel wire, usually at the molar band, it's like a pretty strong force that's doing that. That's the tongue trying to, to keep the kid alive. Um, it's not them playing with pens and, and breaking it. I mean, this is truly a breathing problem. So, uh, and the same thing with the thumb, it, you know, quite often, uh, like here, this is a thumb sucker and the thumb has caused this cranial distortion and has caused this open bite and cross bite. And they want to put a crib in to keep the tongue, uh, the thumb out, but um, she's also got a breathing problem. Okay, what came first, the chicken or the egg? It doesn't really matter at this point. She needs treatment for both. So myofunctional therapy for the thumb 
and arch development for the arch constriction in the open bite that needs to happen and possibly ENT for the chronic mouth breathing and obstruction. So I don't have images of this patient, but she, she likely has uh, the need for a CBCT so the doctor can see the real obstructions in the breathing. So these are all the things that you will see over and over. The severe attrition, we don't just leave that because the teeth are gonna fall out. We still gotta figure out why are they worn down so much, but we can't do it unless we relate the health history to what we see dentally. This patient, I would say, you know, does Mary get headaches? Little Mary, does she get headaches? And the mother might say, oh yeah, she has terrible sleep. She, the, she gets, wakes up with headaches every day. She has terrible sleep. The blankets are all over the place. So these are things that you want to um, uh, ask them to get them in. And with our adults too, you know, they'll, you'll see tori, you'll see open bite. So if this patient has an open bite and it's an adult, you know, yes, you can do myofunctional therapy to help close the bite. But if the cause of the open bite hasn't been addressed, then we're not going to get anywhere stability wise. So you got to really look at the whole picture. And I really, I, I do a lot of myofunctional therapy, uh, studied it for a long time. And I really love being a hygienist in the fact that we can work with dentists who, who can work in that multidisciplinary. So if you're just doing myofunctional therapy and you're not working with a myofunctional dentist, and it, you're not going to get the same results that you could if you had combined treatment. So I'm an advocate for a team. So I hope that all of you doing myofunctional therapy are actually working with a dentist who also um, evaluates patients and, and is interested in the same outcome. Because, you know, this patient might have um, myofunctional therapy, big, broad arches, but is that addressing the clenching problem? Myofunctional therapy doesn't always change the um, nasal obstruction, especially if it's structural. So we have to really have someone evaluate the patients for that. Because as a hygienist, I'm not licensed to, you know, evaluate someone's nasal obstruction. That's not my job. I have to work with someone who can. And there are plenty of dentists who understand these things at this point. Attrition, perio, tongue ties, tori, you see these all day long. These are all people who have possible pain. These people have limited opening. These people have open bites and breathing problems and sometimes have sleep apnea or others. When you see tori like this, my goodness, the patient cannot possibly get their tongue over them. So this is a tongue that's definitely obstructing the airway. And if we can get in and change that parafunction, early enough, maybe when they're small, then they may not grow to be a surgical need. Uh, although today's lasers and things are very uh, effective at reducing those. And certainly, you know, what should be done in these, in these cases to keep, to keep the tongue forward when they sleep, it falls back at night. The appliances today are quite thoughtful and that they do hold tongues forward. Um, but this is an obstruction for the tongue as well. You need the tongue on the palate to maintain health. And so, and I've been saying that for years, the tongue to the palate is the way to go for overall health. Maybe I didn't really understand it completely, but I really did think that, you know, there was a reason why our tongues are supposed to sit up there at rest. And look at the asymmetry in the tongue. You know, tongues can tell you a lot. Above occlusal prane, the, uh, look at the, the, it's almost a shiny tongue. This one, um, you know, is a demonstrating uh, lingual palatal suction. Um, which I will not have time to get into today uh, as far as tongue position. There's a lot of courses you can take on that exact, exact subject. Um, but the malum patties, when they stick the tongue out, if you can see an air hole, uh, that's good. But when you can't see an air hole, then we have obstruction. Same thing with the freedoms and the tongue ties. And the tongue ties can even occur in adults, okay? So here's a classification that uh, Dr. Zaggy does, but we won't have time to get into that. But, um, it's not just stick your tongue out and let's see if you have a tongue tie. I mean, there's different things that we have to classify. There's more to it than that. Um, but this isn't something that should be done at any dental hygiene appointment. This is something that you should say, wow, I think there's a restriction that could be affecting the growth of the jaw or the health of the patient and refer them for more comprehensive evaluation. So um, and even in the pediatric population, the parents don't often know that they're breathing from their mouth. So it's good that they go in and check. 
uh, they're not aware that this is not the path, this is not ideal and that this is not normal. You want to uh, uh, donate to the pediatric screening tool. I'm a big fan of the kids and I'm an advocate for the kids. So I actually donated to this uh, organization and I hope that you all do as well. You can contact the AECP for that. But what's behind the teeth? You know, these teeth look pretty good, but you don't know that the teeth are not necessarily the problem. You can kind of see a fraction. So you know there's clenching. Why is that happening? Yet to be determined without a full evaluation. So this patient has a lot of pain and sleep issues. Quickly, this uh, I'm almost done with the slides and then we'll open it up to for some questions. But this, uh, this patient was treated by Dr. Clower, uh, South Bend, Indiana. And I, I love showing this. He gave me permission to show this years ago. And it's really, really great at showing how the patient with pain and sleep and breathing can get better with just very simple treatments. Now, this patient um, doesn't have a tooth problem. You look at her teeth and go, oh, there's nothing wrong with her teeth. Everything looks good here. But this is a patient just after 10 weeks of treatment. Now, she had different therapies done and she had some breathing uh, evaluation, And but, but she's a different person in just that short period of time. And here she has headaches and here she doesn't. And here she can't breathe very well and here she does. So, so you do have to look at the whole picture and you will change people's lives. And the same thing here. You, you can see the airway constriction, the tight mentalis. So before treatment, different treatment than the previous, but after treatment. And you can see that when they're evaluated, they look, they're treated comprehensively multidisciplinary. Both these cases had multiple practitioners that they worked with. It wasn't just the dentist. And you get to see the results that they get. Completely different. So the props that you're going to add to what you already do, you're going to use a blood pressure cuff if you don't already do that. Uh, I know you have a perio probe. You're going to use a range of motion scale. And I'd like you to add some mylar shim stock to check open bite. So take their blood pressure. Um, you know the ranges, uh, range of motion we talked about. Uh, and if 51, 52, the range from 40 to 55 is, is, would be considered ideal depending on the patient's facial type. But we teach that to you uh, in the comprehensive courses, exactly what the norms would be. Check their jaw, lateral excursive movements. Again, there's normal ranges and there's restrictions as well as protrusion. So we wanna be able to evaluate the patients in a, a orthopedic uh, way. This is the shim stock, that just a occlusal shim. You get it and you have them bite. And if they can, you can pull it through, then they have an open bite. So you all know, you're in dentistry, you all know that teeth erupt until they touch, unless something's in there. So if there's something living in there, like a tongue, then the teeth will not erupt. So that's why there's an open bite. And it's often, um, we see patients who are only contacting on the second molars. They, yeah, they bite down, it doesn't look bad, till you shim and then it pulls it through, or in the front. It looks good, they have, they have over jet, but they, and they have over bite, but there's no contact. So critical that you check this, you know, and it's a good selling feature to the patient to instill the need. Well, your teeth don't touch, and I'm not really sure why, but something's living in there, and tongues aren't supposed to be in there. So you could have you could have a breathing problem at night, but you should investigate it so we know for sure, and doctor can make the proper treatment plan accordingly. Use your intraoral camera because the patients can see the severe occlusal wear and fractures. Use your imaging. Um, you know, if you see a lot of bone loss, you see vertical bone loss, you can relate it to the occlusal trauma and the bruxing and the clenching. You can see the, the gonial notching. Again, look at the muscles pulling if you had that. So, oh my goodness, like that. We see that a lot with clenchers. So, you know, you clench, you might have a headache in the morning. You clench, you might have a breathing problem. So use your tools. My favorite tool is the good old hand mirror. Every patient I see, I give them a hand mirror like this. Okay, everybody gets a hand mirror and I show them what I see. Because if you're just talking and you're not showing them, you're not involving them, um, it's hard for them to understand and relate. And I usually pick about three things. I don't overwhelm them with everything on my list, even though I might have checked off everything on the list. I may recommend find three things, piece it together, and relate it to their health. And I'm confident that they will say, if not the first time you say it, the next time you see them, they'll, you know, because you're going to relate, you're going to make notes about it. And then the next time you're going to, you know, re reinforce it and maybe find that the abfractions are worse or the tongue airway problems worse or the open bites worse, whatever you see. Educate your patients, 
um, for the doctors on uh, the call, you know, your hygienists are going to, you know, do all these great things for you. They're going to evaluate the patient. So whatever they, they have talked to the patient about, you got to support them. You, you don't want to have them say, well, you know, doctor might be able to look at this and they're going to uh, investigate further. And then you say, nah, you know, let's just wait till next time. I mean, because that really looks like the team is not working together. Um, just quickly, uh, before we call it an end here, a quick uh, recare appointment referral and how it's all played out. Because, you know, the patient comes to you and the patient has presentation. You look at them before you even bring them in the chair. I'm evaluating them when I'm bringing them in from the waiting room. So you watch their gait, you watch their presentation. You know, she's got shoulders that are rolled. One's higher than the other. Uh, I'm not talking to the patient about this and I don't recommend you do. Just make some notes because what you're going to do is say, hmm, when I pick up that health history, I'm pretty sure this patient is going to have some, some comorbidities based on her presentation. She looks tired. She's got a forward head posture. She has asymmetries. This is, a, this is a lady who's very, very tired and she looks older than she is. Her health history red flags at the hygiene are, um, she takes Advil for severe headaches. That's slam dunk. How would you like to get rid of your headaches? They all say yes, as if there's something we can do to help your headaches, would you be interested? Oh my God, yes, I don't wanna be on all these, but nothing helps anyways. Perfect. Well, this is great because you're at a place where we can help you. Doctor treats headaches, doctor treats pain and sleep breathing disorders. And you know, you also tell me that you can't sleep all that well. Hmm. Well, the head, the pain and the sleep go together. So how about, I'm gonna clean your teeth today, they look pretty good. It's really not a tooth thing, but I'm going to suggest you come back at a different time for doc to really, really look at all of the, the pain and the sleep and put the pieces all together. And I'm pretty sure doc's going to be able to help you, you know, at least get you somewhat better because severe is, you know, pretty severe. That's not good. You're, you know, you're 50 years old. You're, you have severe headaches every day. Advil extra strength. She also has sinus trouble. So now you can start to see they all have the breathing. So here's the teeth. Look at the severe attrition. Um, look at the heavily restored teeth and look at the tongue. Okay. She can't stick her tongue out. She has like restrictions in the tongue. Not that we diagnose tongue tie based on this, but it's just an assessment at hygiene. Perfect. Let's get her back and make the referral over to the TMJ uh, and sleep therapy center. If you don't in fact treat these disorders and find someone in your area that will but she has persistent chronic headaches and she's unable to sleep. So we know we're gonna have an effect on this patient. So she comes in for the full workup. We take posture photos and uh, so, so we can identify the, the asymmetries. Her chief complaints are headache, difficulty falling asleep and feeling unrefreshed in the morning. And what she wants is eliminate constant headache, being able to get a restful sleep. Perfect. Um, her treatment is, uh, so far she's had a night guard. Okay, so you've heard the story before. They all had have had a night guard. And this is touchy because, you know, she's in your chair. She tells you she has had a night guard for her headaches. And then you say, well, did the night guard help? And they say, well, not really. And I, you know, you do have to explain to them why night guards are made because it's standard of care out there. And lots of people, many of you have made them. And so it's, it's okay. But what we have to explain is that the night guards are designed to protect the teeth from the wear, but they're not designed to rehabilitate the patient and find and treat the cause of the grinding. So that's how you get out of this one because the patient's going to say, oh, I had three of those and I just break them. I don't, I don't, I don't need to come. The doctor's just going to make me another thing that's going to break. You have to say, well, no, not necessarily because doc's going to find the cause of the problem and address that as part of the comprehensive evaluation. This is why your doctor's why you doctors and your doctors um, are members of this organization. The ACP is right there to help educate you and keep you abreast and understanding the relationships to these, these things and how you can keep people staying healthy. So she has this night guard for grinding and we know that night guards actually make OSA worst 40% of the time. So you don't really want to offer that if they have apnea. So four of 10 apnea patients get worse. So you know, let's, let's, before you make these things, they should be fully evaluated. So comprehensive evaluation is what I'm all about. Never make a recommendation 
off of a hygiene appointment, other than come in for further, further investigation. So she has insomnia, weight gain, sinus trouble. Um, she wakes four to six times a night. And you'll hear her in a couple of minutes. I let her, she does a little video of how she felt just after a short period of time. So headaches, teeth grinding, neck pain, shoulder pain, back pain, sinusitis. Again, they all go hand in hand, which is why our intake forms are so comprehensive. Her Epworth sleepy scale was a seven, moderate to severe pain. I'm showing you this not to teach you how to do it, just showing you what you're able to do to a patient by making the referral and getting them in for more comprehensive eval. So this is her a week later. Doesn't she look like a different person? I showed her these pictures and she cried. She said, what, that can't be me. I said, well, yeah, it is. Already you're feeling better. Already your eyes are more open. Already you're sleeping and breathing better. So let's let her tell you. Hi, my name is Anna and I'm a TMJ patient and I'm one week into treatment. As of yesterday, uh, my chief concerns were headaches and not being able to sleep. As of yesterday, my headache had reduced by at least 50%. And today, think that I don't actually have a headache today. I still do have an issue with insomnia. There's no change there, but I am finding that I am sleeping when I do get to sleep, sleeping much sounder and I'm waking a lot more refreshed. I still do wake through the night at least two to four times, which is better than what it was. And as far as sinus congestion, which I used to have, I'm not blowing my nose near as much in the morning. And I just feel much cleaner and clearer when I'm breathing. So overall, I would say a week in treatment, I think I'm doing and feeling much better. So that's the kind of impact you can have on patients. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's beyond the, the, the gums and the, the pockets and the calculus buildup, although that again also has a lot to do with why they're sick. But the take home message today, I hope was that you need to screen everyone, regardless of their age, regardless of why they're there, and that you can't separate the pain in the breathing patient. They have these, these relationships that um, without a thorough investigation, we can't make an assumption. So don't tell someone they need a sleep study when you haven't evaluated them all. So, you know, don't send patients for sleep studies after a you know, quick overview at a hygiene appointment. They really should have more information for, before that. Look for the comorbidities on the health history. They're all there. It's crazy how you, when you start looking, if there's checkoffs on the health history and they're taking us this many meds, you need to stop right there. Don't accept it as, ah, someone's managing those meds. You got to try to piece it together. They, they are expecting this from us. That's why they're paying us. They're, they're paying us to be thorough. Um, and they don't have to shoot the messenger. If they don't want to listen at this point, that's fine. You still document your findings and revisit it next time you see them. Add a couple of objective tools to what you're already doing. So this is, shouldn't be adding more time to your appointment. So if you're not doing blood pressure, do blood pressure. If you don't use the range of motion scale, use the range of motion scale. And shim stock. Those three things alone will give you so much info. The patient will be, um, you know, better educated. You know, um. Think multidisciplinary and know that we in dentistry don't have all the answers and that, again, patients are respectful of. They, they want a team. They don't want to be just one person caring for them. They know their multitude of, of problems and that they need different pr practitioners involved in their treatment. Educate yourself so you can increase your confidence to educate your patients. I would highly recommend if you've never attended Dr. Stephen Almost's mini residency. The next one is in San Diego in the fall. And I encourage this course. If you've been to it, go to it again. It's a fantastic way to really have an overview. You don't need to be a dentist to go to these. If you're a hygienist, you want to learn more. He does a wonderful job and his team do a wonderful job at sharing the multidisciplinary approach that I spoke about today. And this is something that's important. Um, so you can learn more from emailing education at tmjtherapycenter.com. Educate yourself. Join the AACP, which I know most of you are. And the AACP also has lots of training courses too. So uh, for the hygienists and assistants here, they have the, the uh, certified TMJ assistant program. That is, they also have an advanced TMJ assistance program that they, they offer for you that'll help you treat the patients once they've been screened. But uh, there's a lot of information to learn, and please don't let it stop here. 
I learn every day. If I, if I didn't learn, I wouldn't be able to teach these things to you. And, you know, it never, it's never ending. So I want to thank you all for your time today. Open up the questions. So Marlene Cornejo says, does body posture influence in nose breathing? Well, nose breathing usually influences posture. In my experience, if your head is forward, you're going to be a mouth breather. So yes, the answer to that would be yes. You tend to do this when your nose is plugged, but also if, you're, if your avoidance is the jaw and you're forwarding your head forward because your jaw hurts and your neck hurts, that also will encourage a mouth breathing. And the, when you don't use your nose, you know, the old saying, if you don't use it, you lose it. So it's so important. Your nose needs to work all the time or it's going to, you know, collapse. Perfect. And then Malkit Bratch says, what was done for Anna, the last patient? Oh, what was done? She, well, you, she was treated with two appliances, one for the day and one for the night. And she has successfully weaned away from day. So she's, we're just managing her nighttime. And she's since had a sleep study that she does have apnea because we didn't have that information, but she was coming to us for, for headache. And uh, so she has a sleep apnea appliance and no pain. And Rita Gagia says, how and what all do you screen for snoring in infant two month old? I don't have a lot of experience with two month old myself. However, I would, I would guess that if a two year old has snoring, they have a breathing problem and I would have a pediatrician evaluate them. That would be my suggestion. You know, are they going to do sleep study on a two month old? They'd need special equipment. Um, perhaps there's other people on the call who have experience with th that young of a baby, but I would say, yes, if they're snoring, definitely get it looked at. You know, it could be something as simple as managing the man managing inflammation. It could be that they are, um, t they have restrictions in their, in their oral cavity, their tongue, their lips. But yes, I would definitely, if my two-year-old was snoring, I'd want to know why that is. I just want to ask if you can share the classification of tongue ties. The photo shown earlier was blurred. Thank you so much. Okay, so I will get that in the handouts. There's different classifications. The one in my presentation was only one. I'll include in the notes the different ones because there's different ways to do it. So it depends on where you're uh, getting your tongue uh, tie training from. Because uh, it's really a common thing right now. There's a lot of different ways of evaluating it. So what I'll do is I'll plop them all in. And, you know, you can see that you don't just look at one evaluation. You have to look at many to, to make a proper determination. And I think that the speech pathologist and, and the oral myofunctional therapist and orthodontists and dentists who do this would agree with that. You can't just use one evaluation. What type of classification would need treatment also? Well, that depends on the doctor's training, so I can't comment on that because I would not make the determination as a hygienist on tongue tie release, but there's a lot of courses by a lot of good doctors who will help you make that decision. There's a lot of factors you have to do. If they're a little bit tongue restricted and they have no symptoms, like if they're class one with no symptoms, you know, do you or don't you? And if they're class four, they're likely going to have symptoms. Is there a way to confirm a child bruxing at sleep is due to anxiety disorder? If you've ruled out a sleep breathing disorder, because that would be the more likely um, condition, and you've ruled everything else out, and there might be a psychological component, or there could be some medication so that they might be on. And at that point, you, would, you could refer them for psychological evaluation. Rule out the structural stuff first. That's the more, most likely is the structural stuff. Thank you, June, for the wonderful presentation. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.